Hello, Robert Bastian here. Uh, I'm trying to make a pretty quick video here due to some controversy that I am told has arisen around the shaker exercises. Uh, it sounds like uh, at least a few people have gotten quite the wrong impression of what I think about those exercises. And so I just thought it might be useful for me to, to uh, try to elaborate a little bit. And academicians are known for their use of uh, of PowerPoint. So let me just share my screen with you. It, it helps to keep the thinking on track. So the idea of what I want to just talk about is the idea of fixing RCPD without Botox using shaker exercises or actually anything else that uh, you might think of. So whenever I uh, talk about RCPD, I, I always want to do a little bit of background. And the first idea is to make a clear syndromic diagnosis then I would say read up on RCPD, go to the message boards, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, get other people's perspectives who have RCPD and have maybe dealt with it already, and then maybe uh, go to some places that I'll suggest as well. And by all means, try the sh shaker exercises and anything else that uh, you're interested in, but do be aware of what I call belief or bias pitfalls that plague all of us. They plague me, they plague you, they plague, plague everybody. And so it's kind of important to keep uh, track of those, the, the idea of bias. So in terms of making a clear diagnosis, uh, there are cardinal symptoms. And uh, I would say the first is that you can't burp and it's an issue. In other words, you're aware you'd like to burp, but you can't. And it's usually lifelong that you can't burp. Gurgling noises are not quite universal, but close. Some people have quiet and internal gurgling or bubbling or something that others don't hear, but most people you can hear gurgles at least at time a couple feet away to across a large room in, in many cases if it's quiet. Then bloating is the term we just use to mean that feeling of pressure, primarily abdominal, like you're, you're, you're gonna explode but I also use it for the pressure in the chest and the low neck. So a lot of people also have chest and low neck, abdomen, pretty universal, also chest and low neck, bloating in any of those areas, fullness, pressure. And then finally, a remarkable degree of flatulence, uh, just crazy flatulence as people sometimes call it. And especially late in the day, after meals late in the day and, and often through the night, so when a person has these four cardinal symptoms and they add up to what I call severe daily misery, I found that they're just about 100% correct in making their own diagnosis or at least uh, raising their own diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other symptoms, painful hiccups, nausea after eating. These are less universal, but very common. Pa uh, painful hiccups, nausea after eating, hypersalivation where your mouth kind of waters because you're nauseated or full or whatever a feeling of shortness of breath when you're symptomatic, like you just have, don't have any room to, to get any air in. Um, let me think what else, uh, even constipation in some people seems to be related to this disorder. So when you have these uh, symptoms, uh, I'd say read up on RCPD, go to the subreddit on NoBurp. That's one of the best places I'm told I've just visited it very briefly, I think one or two times. I wish I had more time to monitor those uh, places. Facebook has an RCPD group, YouTube. There are quite a few videos now of people who, some of them are very informative and some are entertaining and they're heartwarming and all of that. Google it and so forth. Find everything you can. And we've done our part to help you find your way to good information. This is my personal teaching website called Laryngopedia, laryngopedia.com. Type R hyphen CPD into the search window. Up come a number of articles, but the first one here, if you click on that, it opens up and there are images, there's an explanation, the articles, six or seven articles that have been written are there, uh, the Reddit, uh, you know, so that we're trying to help people find all the various places they can get good information. Um, now, by all means, try the shaker exercises and anything else you can find that, that works. If you find a solution, however, I'd say, please share it. And people have contacted me and I've said, 
please try to make your technique as simple as cookbook as you can so that people can follow exactly your steps of the movements you do and the things you do to, to make it work. And if possible, share a video and teach me. I'm eager to know how you're doing it. Um, now, be aware of the issue of belief. Uh, and I'm not, again, discounting anybody, but I just would say I have to watch this in myself, and I think you do too. If you just go to the internet and type in uh, cognitive bias or just bias even, you'll come up with many, many different uh, websites, and there are, a lot of them are really good. And I'm just going to share a few uh, things, uh, pitfalls that I run into in medicine. Uh, correlation versus causation, that's a huge one. The moon was full. I had my accident that night. The full moon caused my accident. They're related in time, but are they related in causation? The human mind inexorably wants to put things that happen close together into this causal relationship. Could be causal, but you have to be careful. Uh, confirmation bias. When we sort of believe something, everything that comes into us uh, it goes through that screen of what we already believe and we're kind of s sifting and sorting and finding things that help us to believe what we already believe even more. That's called confirmation bias. The genetic fallacy, wow, is this a big one in, our, in today's world? It's the idea that you do not have to, to evaluate someone's ideas depending on who they are oh, that person is such and such, and so anything he or she says can be discounted on the face of it. I don't have to come to terms with what they're saying. That's the genetic fallacy. Um, uh, selective perception. We tend to see what we expect to see. Uh, the problem of anecdote. A real quick story here. I did a big uh, sort of seminar for people with a rare neurological disorder of voice called spasmodic dysphonia, where the voice kind of catches and grabs and squeezes like this, and it cuts out and loose. And so it's a it's a pretty bad uh, neurological problem, and it's treated with Botox. Uh, that's the standard of care. Because it's neurological, the Botox has to be repeated about three times a year on average. Neurological disorders aren't very susceptible to teaching. Our CPD is not neurological, in my opinion. And so that's why we can do a once and done treatment in so many cases. Um, so, but anyway, at this meeting of 80 people, a woman stood up near the end of the, during a question and answer, and she was very well-intentioned. I don't uh, doubt that at all, but she stood up and almost reproached the group. She, she was kind of, uh, uh, well, reproaching everyone. And she said, I do not understand why everybody here isn't on medication X, Y, Z, because I take that medicine and it, and it really helps my voice. And I've compared notes during the breaks of this meeting and almost there almost nobody on it. And it just is ridiculous to me that everyone here isn't on it. Well, she hardly finished and a woman across the room popped up and, and almost angrily said, oh my goodness, I've tried so many medicines including that one and all it did for me was make me sleepy so you see that's the problem of anecdote i had another person uh, actually same disorder and she came in and she said uh noni juice i'm still not quite sure what noni juice is but she said i started drinking noni juice and my voice is so much better well this is a disorder that is known to evolve over time it can get a little better a little worse so if she started her noni juice right when the problem was evolving on its own, can you see how she would connect those things together and really come to believe in noni juice? So she was frustrated with me for being uh, agnostic. I wasn't uh, you know, against what she was saying. And so I said to her, look, I'll be glad to tell uh, other people about noni juice. So we made that information known widely. I never ever had anybody else come to me and say, you're right, noni juice did. So you see, that's the problem of anecdote and selective perception and confirmation bias and all of that. Now, uh, do I understand how or why the shaker exercises work for some people? I, think I have to be honest, I do not. But please understand the difference between being agnostic 
where I say, I don't know, I'm not sure, I, I can't come down on one side or the other. That isn't the same as being disbelieving. There are people who think that if you don't buy into what they're saying, you don't believe them. It isn't that I don't believe people, it's that I just have to remain neutral agnostic because I don't have personal uh, information. I have a, a few anecdotes and that's about it. And by the way, we alert our patients to the shaker exercises constantly. Uh, so, you know, that I hope uh, conveys to you that we, we are definitely open to them. It's just that we're agnostic. Why am I agnostic? Well, limited experience with them. I don't have a large group of people where I know, have the before and the after, and I, you know, I can get some sort of a, a, a get a little beyond the idea of anecdote. I, I, I just don't have that experience. So for now, I have limited experience, and so I have to remain agnostic. The other problem that I have is that I can't really reason through to why they work. That again doesn't mean that I don't believe people that it's working. It just I'm just simply saying I don't know why it's working. Um, and the reason is the 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 as I see it, the, the what you're strengthening mostly with the shaker exercises is what we call orthopedic, the muscles of the neck that move and turn and and all of that. Uh, the those are mostly innervated by spinal nerves, or at least partly by spinal nerves. The visceral compartment, which is voice and swallowing, is innervated by cranial nerves. Furthermore, the issue isn't that we need more strength. We don't need the, the sphincter muscle to clamp better, to be stronger. We need it to relax. We need it to go limp at the appropriate moment so that the air can come up when we need to burp. So I do have a, a, a little speculation about why it is that they may be working for some people. Uh, and I, again, I'm agnostic about this, but I'm just presenting it for you to, to consider. And it's through the power of mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness is really powerful uh, because humans have some capacity for self-correction, which we should harness whenever we can. Here's an example. Send twins, identical twins, who both have exactly the same voice disorder, say an injury, to two different speech pathologists. The first one uses technique A, the second one uses technique B, which is quite different from technique A. The, the Both patients are improved when you see them in follow-up. And I, I became curious about that many years ago because now and again, they would have used a technique that I would think would be counterproductive or, or not useful. So I came up with the idea that you're working with another human being who is warm and affirming and is helping to direct your attention to what you're doing and that it is self-correcting. So I wonder that about Shaker, whether the just the effort and the exercise and the attention is uh, leading people to some sort of uh, self-correction. By the way, uh, you know, we do have people who who... Uh, became able to burp, and I have no idea how, a, a mother who, I think she said when she turned 40, almost, I think she said almost on her birthday, she had never been able to burp for 40 years, and then she turned 40, and she was able, she'd been able to burp ever since then. I don't know why that happened. She didn't do the shaker exercises, so I, I, I just don't know. Uh, I, I think I've had a one or two who figured out how to burp during pregnancy, um, I, I can speculate a little bit better why that might be because of the increased pressure. Uh, but anyway, so uh, mindfulness. So what is my overall suggestion about the shaker exercises? Please try them. I, I they, are, they can't hurt. So please try them for whatever period of time you like. I've had people contact me and say, I did them for a year I remember one person did them for a year. I think he said an hour. He worked on them an hour a day and became able to micro burp. Never really got good burping. But so, you know, try them and report back to the community and please to me as well. Try anything else you can find too. But I would ask that we don't discount Botox as an option because I don't want people to feel like they're a failure if they, you know, if they've done it by it here, I mean the shaker exercises. If you've done them, I should say 
um, if that technique doesn't work for you, you're not a failure. It, it just didn't work for you. And so please keep Botox open as an option, maybe for a year from now or 10 years from now or whatever. And then do remember what I have said, uh, and this sounds extreme, but I'm trying to make a point when I lecture. Sometimes I say, you know, the problem with rare and unusual disorders is that every treatment works for someone. Noni juice works for someone. This medication XYZ works for someone, but it doesn't necessarily work for everyone. So uh, that, uh, in a nutshell, is my perspective. So I hope that gives a little bit more nuance to what I said. I think this is what I said during the, the webinar, but I'm afraid that I didn't clearly enough convey my affirmation and openness to the shaker exercises. So please uh, do them if you've got the interest and the time and uh, teach us something. Thanks for listening.